I'm okay because I move around, so that's fine. Where's Jake? Okay, folks. Um, I don't think I, you need reminders, right? You know, the project is due on Monday. I mean, it, the, the old days, I don't know whether this guy's still around. In Times Square, there used to be this. I was going to say crazy guy, but that's the rule rather than the exception in Times Square. This guy with unkempt hair, and every time you walk by, it have a Bible and says, end is near, repent, repent. I feel like doing that with each of you. The end is near, repent, repent. No, but I think you're ready for the end. So the end is coming, right? The project is getting due. So not your life sand, right? So don't worry, I'm not trying to plan to kill all of you or something on, on Monday, but your project is due on Monday. So a couple of things about the project I want to kind of talk about. One is, as you start putting the project together, you work with the page constraint. You realize that, right? Does that remind me again what your page constraint is? Let's see how many of you actually read that section. You didn't know there was a page constraint. There is a page constraint, right? Don't spend more than four or five pages on an individual company, which is a challenge if you're a verbose person, you want to explain to me every single detail of your discounted cash flow valuation. Here's what's not going to work. We say, look, this is how I got my beta. I started with the unlevered beta. Then I look for the debt to equity ratio. Then I multiply. I know how to get to a levered beta. I will assume you know as well. So here's my suggestion. If you want to summarize your discounted cash flow valuation, I know different reports have done it differently. Probably the most effective way of summarizing what your entire DCF is doing is to actually take a picture of the story worksheet in your discounted cash flow spreadsheet. Everything's in there, right? I know your growth rate, I know your margin, I know your story. You can enrich it if you want by adding things, but it's the one repository for everything you've done. And it'll save you three pages of writing and it'll do it much more effectively because it'll tie your story to your numbers and say, this is why I'm assuming growth. So take a picture. My only plea to you is remember with my eyes, I can't see really small things. So if you take a picture and you shrink it to a quarter of a page, I will see there's something there. But beyond that, I'll not know what's in it. So if you take a picture, at least make it fill a page so I can see what you've assumed. So it's going to save you for your discounted cash flow valuation. That's effectively your DCF. That's your page. I don't want your worksheets. I don't need your worksheets. I don't want to see your worksheets. I don't want five attached worksheets or spreadsheets. So basically, don't send me the spreadsheets. I have zero interest in them. The time for that has come and gone. Right? That was what the feedback was. So now at this stage, all I care about is your summary. On the pricing, keep it compact. Tell me your sample, tell me your multiple, tell me what you found, and don't forget to make your recommendation, buy, sell, or hold, right? 
I think it's easily fittable in three pages. I think adding an extra page gives you buffer. So, you know, do what you need to do. But uh, send in one report per group, Monday, PDF file, and we'll go with it. Yes, Jack. Hey, come in. So that's the project part. Any questions on the project? 5 p.m. on Monday, right? That's a due. due. Let's talk about uh, the last pieces of valuation today. I'm going to complete the discussion of acquisitions. Remember, I was trying to sell you a company that was worth only 60 million, trying to get you paid more than 60 million. You're being very resistant. I tried to get you to use your cost of equity and saying that pushes up value and said no. Then I tried to convince you that you had a lot of cheap debt and that could do it. And you said no. I tried to attach a 20% control premium and you said no. And then I tried to throw the magic word synergy and you still said no. So today I'm going to keep trying to get you to pay more than 60 million. But after I do that, we're going to turn our attention to how do you change the value of a company? It's a very different conversation, right? Up till now, what's the question we're answering? How do you estimate the value of a company? And if you're an investor, that's all you care about. But I want to ask, how do you change? Why do we care about the answer to that? Who, or who cares about the answer to that? How do I change the value of a company? Or founders, owners, business. So basically anybody within the business, this is your job, right? And if you're an owner, this is your value. How do you change? If you think about consulting, especially the top of the end consulting, it's really about going into companies and trying to convince them that they want that these are the things you do to enhance value. But I want to draw a contrast between value enhancement and price enhancement. And given the discussion we've had about value and price, you can already see where that's going. So here's a test. Let's suppose I came to you. the series of actions with each one, I want you to tell me whether there'll be a value effect first. So think cash flows, growth and risk. And then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Could it have a price effect? You know what a stock split is? What happens in the stock split? Deep. You basically take every shareholder, you have one share, I give you four shares instead, right? What does a stock split do to my value of the company? It doesn't change, right? Cash flows, growth and risk. But could it affect the price? Why? What, what are the reasons a stock split could affect the price? Well, that'll always happen, right? But so why is that good or bad? I thought that was bad, right? To have more shares outstanding. By itself, it's usually viewed as a bad thing to have more shares. What is it about a stock split that might make you push up the price per share of the company? It's zero price, right? And but everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. Nobody gets it. That's the problem, right? If you were the only one getting a stock and I got an extra share, it's a freebie. But if everybody gets it, that's worth nothing. Could it make you more optimistic about the company's future? No, you know what? Amazon hit $2,000 per share, right? Does it 10 for one. Two things are accomplished with the stock split. One is the price per share drops to about 200. Why is that good? Because there are people who might not have been able to buy a 2000. So maybe that there's a demand effect. Remember, price is demand and supply. So there are investors who might buy your shares because they're cheaper. They're, you know, even though they're not technically cheaper, but they're because of more units, it's easier to buy shares. The second is there's a signal. A company that expects its stock price to decrease in the future, at least that's the way your story plays in your head, is not going to split its stock. So you're saying, you know, stock split must mean that they're optimistic about the future. There's a pricing effect. There's no value effect, pricing effect. How about the amortization of goodwill? First, what is this amortization of goodwill crap that we read about? What, what does that mean? Sophia, what is, what is it? So, who makes that judgment? Oh, so you hire Deloitte and Ernst & Young. They land in your company and say, guys, you paid too much on what that deal you did three years ago. So we're going to write off a billion and a half. That's amortization. This is terrible, right? You're writing off. That's a big loss. Will it have a value effect? Let's suppose the company you picked has amortizes two billion in goodwill tomorrow. Does it change your value per share?
Yes. Unless you read that and say, oh my God, I thought this company was a great acquiring company. And I've seen, but remember, accountants are reflecting mistakes that everybody knows you made two, three years ago. By the time it happens, it's old news. Your value is unaffected by somebody amortizing a mistake. It's a sunk cost. It's a mistake in the past. Do you think there's a pricing effect when a company announces a $7 billion? No, at first reaction, that's a big loss. You know, markets are incredibly perceptive when it comes to goodwill amortization. The price effect of amortizing goodwill is zero, which makes you wonder, why do we pay all these accountants all this much money to come in and tell us things that everybody seems knows? But that that you know that horse has left the barn you know too many people are making money rewriting writing goodwill but it's a useless exercise don't tell the, so you go to work for deloitte and they put you in charge of, don't tell your managing director why we're we doing this useless exercise it's paying your salary just do the useless exercise move on but remember nobody cares what about changing depreciation? You know what, when, when you change depreciation methods, it can affect your income, especially if you go from accelerated depreciation to straight line depreciation. Let's say you do it only in your reporting books. You know, in the US that's legal to do, change your depreciation. What effect does that have on your valuation? What do you do in valuations? You start with earnings, right? And now I'm going to report higher earnings. You think this is good, but then what do I do? I add back depreciation. The cash flow effect is zero, right? But could it affect pricing? What do people react to? What do, what's a big you know, bottom line number in every earnings report the Wall Street Journal runs the next day? What, what do they look at? Earnings per share, right? So I change depreciation methods. My earnings per share pops seven cents. There's going to be some lazy trader out there saying, this is an amazing company. I'm going to buy 10,000 more shares of it. It's a pricing effect. You know what tracking stock is? Very common, the late 90s, New York Times did it. They took a segment of the company. It stayed part of the New York Times, but they allowed people to buy shares in that segment. You're saying, why would you do that? That segment was called NewYorkTimes.com. You see what they were trying to take advantage of, right? Peak of the dot-com, boom, people were paying big prices. They effectively said, this part of the company is NewYorkTimes.com. You can buy shares in it. Still same companies, still same cash flows. But will there be a pricing effect? Of course there will be. What do you think would happen if tomorrow Microsoft issued tracking stock on chat GPT? You think people would buy it? I think you could make tens of billions of dollars if you're Microsoft from doing it simply because people think, hey, that's a fad word. In general, there are things can, that can change prices but have no effects on value. Could changing your name as a company affect your value as a company? We'll talk about that, right? You say, why would that? You're going to see that it can be a pricing effect. Having a different name for a company can have a pricing effect. So one of the things we're going to start with a question. So when CEO says, I want to enhance my company's value, I'm going to stop and say, are you sure you want to enhance your company's value or do you want to enhance your company's price? Because a set of recommendations I'm going to make on what you need to do are going to be very different. Value enhancement versus price enhancement. But let's focus on value enhancement. You've risen up the ranks. You've now become the newly anointed CEO of a multi-business company. I've been very creative in naming the businesses. They're called A, B, C, and D. Okay. You can see they're very, very different businesses. I've computed the return on capital and cost of capital of each business. You ready? You're going to divest one of these businesses. Which of these businesses would you pick to divest? Sounds like a slam dunk. Go for it because I'm just waiting for you on the other side. Okay. Which is the which looks like the outlier D, right? Looks like a terrible business. And what are we taught in, in business school? Get rid of the terrible business, right? What is the effect of divesting a business? So think about the value of your equity as a company. When you divest something, what is the effect on your value of a divestiture? What happens when you divest something? You Something leaves your company. What do you get in return? What somebody pays for the company, right? 
You know what the effect of a divestiture is? It's a difference between what the value of what you divested and what the price of what you divest. And what are you divesting? Your crappy business, right? Does everybody know it's crappy? Yeah, kind of. So when you try to sell this business, what kind of a price do you get? A crappy price. A crappy price might not be better than a crappy value. I, this sounds counterintuitive, but if you're looking for businesses where you can increase value, it's businesses where the price is much higher than the value. You know what kinds of, which divisions are going to be most likely to be those businesses that get too high a price? It's your best businesses. It's the businesses where you have the most potential, where there's the greatest growth. It, it's counterintuitive because that's not what companies do, but Maybe after a new CEO comes in, rather than get rid of your worst businesses, you'd be trying to sell your best businesses for the highest price. You can come back and try to fix or do whatever you can with the worst businesses. But value enhancement is tricky because you have to think about what the effect is. Not just of what you're selling, but what you get in return. One final question. This, I think, is company that is back in the... When I wrote this, this question, the answer I expected was very different than the answer I might get today. This was about eight years ago. Google is the peak of its glory. The heart of the Fangam stocks have been doubled in market cap, company with great returns, $60 billion cash balance. Google decides to return $45 billion in buybacks. Will you, as a shareholder in Google, be better off or worse off? when it returns that cash. What does that depend on? Well, the value of cash is cash, right? unless what? You don't trust the management of the company. So in 2015, the question is, do you trust Google's management? The answer would probably have been almost universally. Of course I do. Company in 11 years has gone from being nothing to a half a trillion dollar company. Do you think if I asked that question today, there might be a little more shakiness? You notice a lot more negative stories about Google. First, how many great investments has Google made beyond that first search box? I've always wondered. They call themselves Alphabet, right? They claim to be in what, eight businesses, but it's really Snow, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, right? There's a search box that's 94% of everything they do, and the Seven Dwarfs all lose a ton of money and account for the remaining 6%. Nothing that Google has done outside of the search box has made the money. In 2015, people said, it's coming any day. It's coming any day. At some point in time, they said, maybe it's not coming. And on top of that, they've completely screwed up for whatever reason, at least from the outside, this AI thing, right? They've let Microsoft become somehow the winner of this game. It's too early to make winners and losers. I'll wager today that if Google did a buyback, the stock price would pop. Because people, I think, have lost trust. It can happen over short periods. Facebook, in fact, did a buyback precisely for this, re for this reason. People don't trust Facebook anymore. So as we talk about value enhancement, we're in a sense going to revisit those corporate finance questions about dividend policy and investments in capital structure. Okay. So let's turn back to where we were in the acquisition section. Remember, I was trying to sell you this target company, right? Do you remember the base value, 60 million? I tried to get you to pay 100 million using your cost of equity and you said no. Then I tried to convince you that if you use debt, this cheap debt and debt capacity and your cost of capital would go down, you said no. Tried to add 20% premium for control and you said no. Then it's synergy and you said no, there's no synergy. So now I'm getting desperate. So here I said, hey, look, let's forget this intrinsic value stuff. It's not working for us. You want to acquire a company, you got to pay a reasonable price. I'm going to price the target company. And how do we price companies? We find comparables, we take a multiple, and we come up with the pricing. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to find comparables, but rather than look at all companies, I'm going to look at what are called transaction multiples. What transaction multiples are? You look at only companies that have done acquisitions, you look at the prices paid on acquisitions. I want to think about whether that might create some kind of a bias in this process. So that's my peer group. And then I get to try different multiples and I pick the one that works for me best, which is the multiple that gives the high. So I say, look, 
There are people out there who are paying five times EBIT. That's what the transaction multiple said. That's what you need to do to get a transaction done is pay five times 20 million, which is 100 million. In fact, in fact, if you balk, I'm willing to make it five times future EBIT as if that makes the problem go away. But the big number is five, right? Which I got from looking at a pure group of transaction multiples. Hold on to the thought. You're saying what's wrong with pricing? Nothing wrong. But the question you've got to ask is, is this good pricing? Is this a buyer set? And I noticed you're still a little uncomfortable. And I said, no, no, you, you got to remember this deal is an accretive deal. Bankers love that word. You know what accretive means? What does accretive mean? Anybody? You know, look right It increases earnings per share. It's as simple as that. Here's how it goes from increasing earnings per share to increase prices. Let's say you have a company trading at 20 times earnings, right? The earnings per share is $2. You have an accretive deal. What happens to your earnings per share? It goes from $2 to $2.10. You can see the logic then, right? 20 times 2.10 is 5% higher. Accretive deal. So there is this notion among bankers. Accretive deals are good deals. Dilutive deals are bad deals. One of the most absurd notions you can think of. We're going to talk about the mathematics that makes a deal accretive. And you're very quickly going to see that can't be right. So let's take these two things separately. Let's start with the pricing question. Statistics, we're take samples all the time, right? But once, what's a one cardinal rule in statistics that you're not allowed to break when you sample? You cannot create a bias sample. I'll give you an example of a bias sample. You know, the coronation is coming up, right? You're all keeping track of it in your calendar. You know what I'm talking about? King Charles is going to finally become king. I've been waiting for this moment for like 30 years every day. So please God, make King Charles... It's coming, right? And it's going to be a TV show all day. So let's suppose you wait for the coronation and then you sample people who watch the entire coronation. This is like eight hours of watching the king walk in slow motion and then, you know, all the... And then you ask them what you, they think about the monarchy. What do you think the answer is going to be? If you pick the people who watch eight hours of the coronation, say, what do you think of British royalty? This is the most amazing thing to ever walk the face of the earth. 99% approval. Why? Because you've got a sampling bias. I don't think any of the people in this room, if you're the exception, don't put up your hand. I don't think you want to self-reveal yourself. Is planning to watch an eight-hour coronation? That requires a very special, special is a good word here, a very different mindset to be able to do. that sampling bias. The problem with transaction multiples is a sampling bar. So if you want to price a target company, what should you do? Do it honestly, which means do the pricing the way we always do. Sample across all software companies, not just ones that were targets of acquisitions. That's a much cleaner pricing. And as for accretive, how does a deal become accretive? What, what do you have to do in terms of math? You're a company with a PE ratio of 20. What has to be true about the PE ratio of the target company for, you, for the deal to be accretive? Lower or higher than 20? It's got to be lower than 20. If you buy any company, the PE ratio lower than yours, your earnings per share will go up. If you use debt to do an acquisition, your earnings per share will go up. So you're telling me any debt-driven acquisition of a company with a lower PE ratio than mine is a good deal? That doesn't make any sense. In fact, why do companies have lower PE ratios than mine? They have lower growth and higher risk, right? When I acquire them, guess what I do to my own PE ratio? I'm going to bring it down. So even though my earnings per share might be higher after the deal, there's no guarantee the price will be higher. In fact, McKinsey showed that accretive deals actually deliver lower value for shareholders than dilutive deals. If I had my druthers, I would retire both words from the M&A language. No talk of a creative and dilutive in this room because it basically distracts you from looking at what you're paying. So don't be a lemming. Just because everybody's paying five times EBIT doesn't make it okay for you to pay it. And moving it to your five or your 10 doesn't make the sin go away. And remove the words accretive and dilutive. There's no indicator indication you're going to get by looking at the deal's accretion or dilution to get a sense of it's a good deal or not. So at this stage, I've hit a dead end, right? You're not refusing to pay a premium. I've tried everything I can. So I hit you with what I think is my trump card. 
nothing political in that statement. Trump card as in the, no, so I'm not making any statements about politics. Here's my Trump card. I say, you, got, you are being very difficult. I'm talking to you right across the table. So I've been trying to sell you the company. You keep saying no and no and no. Do you know your CEO really wants to get this deal done? You know what I'm trying to say is most deals originate at the top and percolate down. Which means that the CEO really wants to get the deal done. I'm just going to go over your head and the deal's going to get done. And the other argument I can make is there are other companies in this business who are doing deals. And if you don't do deals, they're called defensive deals. Everybody else is doing a deal. If you don't do a deal, you're going to fall behind. Everybody's buying an AI product. I mean, banks, this was a big deal. Everybody's investing in fintech. You got to invest too, even though you're overpaying by massive amounts. So saying, is that justification? The CEO wants to do it or the deal everybody else is doing? Obviously not, but it's actually one of the most difficult pushbacks you're going to have. Do you know that when you look at companies and you look at the premiums paid on acquisitions, that the premiums paid on acquisitions are correlated with the size of the CEO's ego? I'm not making, there's actually a study that did this. You know, how the heck did they measure an ego? They didn't hire psychologists to go in. They actually looked at the number of press mentions of a CEO's name. And they said, the more times your name is, Jamie Dimon must have an ego the size of a, I don't know, the universe, right? I mean, think of how often you see Jamie Dimon, Jamie Dimon, Jamie Dimon, right? So they looked at the correlation. They said, the bigger the ego, the larger the premium. And that doesn't surprise me. In behavioral finance, you know the most deadly quality that you bring into investing in a business is? It's overconfidence. What is overconfidence? You think you can do things you really cannot do. These are the people in high school who really used to piss you off, right? They knew very little, but they acted like they knew it all. These are the people who will rise up the ranks to become CEOs, trust me. Because that bluster is going to overwhelm everything along the way. So you get overconfident people rising to the top. What does it mean when you're overconfident? You look at a target company, you pay a 30% premium percentage, I can pull it off. That's what overconfidence is. You think you can do things that really cannot be done. You know that overconfident CEOs are the constant when you look at companies doing acquisitions. It's not that company, the, as the CEO moves around from company to company, the acquisitions go with the CEO. It's the person, not the company. That is acquisition driven. So what do you do if you have an overconfident CEO? Try to sell him as much stuff as possible. Soothe his ego. Be like the Japanese. I'm nothing. You're everything. It's a, it's a negotiate. It's, it's amazing, right? The Japanese basically, oh, I, I, I didn't. You are so great. It's a great strategy because it feeds into the ego. I am so great. I can pay 80% premiums. You collect the premium and then you go back home and you tell your wife, look, that stupid guy you told him he was the greatest. Yeah, I don't think much about him. Great negotiating strategy. Play to the ego. And as for defensive deals, let's suppose I told you you're in a business where the only way you survive is by overpaying for companies. What should your response be? I don't want to survive. Why is survival so critical? If the only way you can survive in the airline business is by throwing money into the ground and it never comes out, maybe you shouldn't be an airline. Just sell yourself to that big ego CEO the other airline and walk away. There's no, there's no glory in survival for the sake of survival. There shouldn't be, which is one reason I will avoid anybody who has sustainability in their name or any class with the word sustainability as part of its title. Sustainable what? I know it's a big word now in business and everybody wants to be sustainable. I understand sustainability at the planet level, right? We want the, what does it mean when you say, I want to sustain a company? Why? Do you want to sustain Bed Bath & Beyond? I don't, right? What about GE? It's a dead man walking, let it go, right? So when you look at those, those, those reasons for acquisitions, they don't work out. And finally, let's talk about the accountability factor. You all heard of HP, right? Hewlett Packard, legendary company. You know that venture capital, as we know it in the US, was born with HP. It's the first company that drew on venture capital. It's been around. It built Silicon Valley. 
Now, Hewlett and Packard built their first computers in the garage. Garages are big in Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs garage. Maybe they shouldn't build houses, just build garages all over Silicon Valley. They seem to be more productive. No research labs, just garages. Right. But it's a company that grew with Silicon Valley. And what was its primary product through its glory years? What made HP a great company? What did it make? That's in the down days. Printers are when they hit, they hit the dead end. They made computers. They made computers more, you know, the IBM did the big mainframe, HP did the smaller computers, and then the PC business effectively killed them. So by the time you get to 2003 or four, the printers were the only thing keeping them alive, right? It's really not even printers. We know how printer companies make money. It's with the ink they have to, it's like Gillette, right? The razor model basically put the, give the razor away for free, then charge $15 a blade. Okay. And HP was still ambitious. They want, they thought of themselves as a great technology company. So they kept trying to reinvent themselves by doing what? By doing big acquisitions. Spend 10 billion in acquisition, then three years later, they'd write off 8 billion. So they did this, you know, over and over again. And this was actually an acquisition they did of a company called Autonomy. It's a British software services company. HP actually paid $11.1 billion for the company. And I wanted to see where that 11.1 billion. So I built up to that value. I started with the book equity of the company, which is accounting numbers we know. But in, in this case, Autonomy actually hired, I don't know, Deloitte to come in and write up the book value. What does that mean? They come in and they look at their existing assets, they do a little dance and they say, that's what three times more. Two, but that written up value that they came up with was 4.6 billion. So think of that as the fair value of assets in place according to accountants. The market value was 5.9 billion. So each step you're adding an extra value, that the extra 1.3 billion, maybe that's for growth assets. So far, so far, the differences are 1 billion, 2 billion. And then HP comes in and offers 5.2 billion on top of this. Why they claim that there was synergy and control and they paid the premium. Acquisition gets done. At the time that they did this, everyone else in the business was flabbergasted at how much they paid. They thought they'd paid too much. So Leo Apotheker was the CEO of HP. New York an Equity Research Conference is asked to defend it. I'm going to read what he said word for word because I can't keep a straight face. So I'm going to turn my face this way so you don't see what the look on my face is. This is Leo talking to the Equity Research Analyst. So why do you pay so much? He says, the face of almost universal feeling, HP had paid, is what Leo says. We have a pretty rigorous approach inside HP that we follow for all our acquisitions, which is a D dot C dot F slash based model. As I said, I'll repeat, you know, the very fact that he says a D dot C dot F slash base model tells me he's never actually done a DCF. There's, what is a D dot C, what is based, what is that base doing? I'm not sure, you know. And then the, 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 the journalist to show you that they know nothing about DCF decides to fill in the rest. In reference to discounted cash flow valuations, the journalist expanding our D dot C dot is a look, I know what D and C and F stand for, good. A standard valuation methodology. And here's Leo again, and we tried to take a very conservative view. Leo should have stopped right there because he kept going. So let's see what Leo said next. He said, just to make sure everybody understands, autonomy will be on day one, creative. I'm, I'm okay now. It's an accretive deal, right? Just take it from us. We did that analysis at great length in great detail. So it's two greats already. And we feel we paid a very fair price for autonomy and will give a great return. Third great comes in. I wish I could end the story here. One year later, that 11.1 billion that HP paid for autonomy got written down to 2.3 billion. It was an $8.8 .8 .8 billion mistake. And I decided when you make an $8.8 .8 .8 billion mistake, I want to hold people accountable. So I'm going to take the 8.8 .8 .8 billion and I'm going to assign blame to different groups. The first group I'm going to blame are the people who actually did the deal. That big merger expectation. So Leo Potheker should not just be fired, but you need to claw back every dollar you paid him over its lifetime. 
And if you can sell his house, liquidate his investment holdings, take back the lease car, get it all back. Before you feel too sorry for him, you know, it's a big mistake, right? You make a hundred thousand dollar mistake, you get fired. This guy's made a four billion dollar mistake. And if I can, I'd also like to do you know, all those deal makers. I think it was Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. I want my money back, right? What kind of deal advice is this? That's the first stop. So that's 4.4 billion of the mistake. 1.7 billion, HP claimed that the accountants at Autonomy had played accounting games. It turned out that they had played some accounting games. So I said, that's about 1.7 billion. And I'd like to get that money back from Deloitte because they were the ones who did the accounting games. So Deloitte's going to pay me 1.7 billion. Goldman's going to pay me about a billion or pay not me, but the shareholders in HP. And finally, I also said, you know what, the remaining, they actually took a comp the autonomy and made it a worse company in HP. So I said, the CEO followed Leo Apotheker and, and, and the, the current management and its auditors are responsible for the remaining money. 8.8 .8 billion is signed across different groups. You know how many of these groups actually ended up being held accountable for this? None. How the heck do you get away with this? How do you make an $8.8 .8 billion mistake and nobody seems to be responsible? It might explain why we have so many bad deals is the deal gets pushed through and nobody gets held responsible for all those forecasts and claims made at the type of the deal. So lots of negative stuff in acquisitions, right? So you think, is there any hope? I have to go work in m and you know, it's, it sounds like, you know, I'm going to go work in hell and you probably are, but I'll give you a few cool spaces in hell, you know, when it gets really hot, you can go in here. So think of this as a hopeful end to this process. So with each one, I'm going to ask you, so your job, you work in m and and you're saying, I want to create value. You're still one of the last people left in this space who wants to create value. Here are your choices. Do you want to be a sole bidder or be part of a bidding war? which probably gives you a great chance. Soul better, right? I'll show you the evidence on what. Do you want to go after public targets or private targets? Tell me why. What is it about public targets that makes acquisition so much more difficult? You got to pay market price plus, right? Market price, God only knows what. Whereas with private businesses, you start with the value you estimated. You know what's in there. So you can say, I can pay a premium for that. Do we prefer to pay with cash or pay with shares? It's a tough one. What do you think it should depend on? Well, what do you think about your own shares? As the acquiring company, if you think of overpriced shares, you'd like to pay with them, right? But here's a, the gaming system that happens. Let's suppose you decide to pay with shares and I'm a target company shareholder. I can observe what you did, right? You picked shares. What do I read into that? That guy must think his shares are overpriced. So what do I do? I push up the premium. This, I mean, this is game theory at its best, right? Because you effectively see both sides playing this game. You're probably going to pay a larger premium when you pay with shares. The net effect is going to determine whether this is good. So let's see if that varies across companies. Would you prefer to go after small targets or big targets? Mergers of equals or mergers of unequals, where your chance is greater of creating value. What happens when $200 billion companies come together? Everybody's happy the day after, they do dances, they're good friends. It's like two separate entities continue to exist for five years because they have their own cultures. And Daimler bought Chrysler. I remember thinking, how is this going to work? You have the quintessential German company buying a US automobile. You can see the culture war coming. It took them five years to say, this is, you know, like a wedding that should never have happened, a divorce that's long overdue, but you could see with big companies. It... And finally, would you go for cost synergies or growth synergies? Where do you think your odds are better? Yes. And why is that? Or it could be some other guys. You shut a distribution, set it down. You have plans. You can easier to make plans because it's concrete. You're saying, this is what I'm going to do. 
Let's see if this is in fact true by looking at the actual evidence. This is an academic chart. How do you, can you tell? It comes out of a paper. It's kind of a primitive chart, right? It looks like a pre-Excel chart. No, no colors, no, no. Very difficult to read, but no, it actually tells a story. It looks at two bidders in a bidding war. I'll tell you, the, I, I'll, get, I'll, I'll take the suspense out of the story. One of these guys wins the bidding war. One loses the bidding war. This is what happens to the stock prices of the two companies. So day, day zero is when the winning or losing happens. So that's a day in which you decide who the winner is. And this is the stock price after. One of these is the winner's stock price. And one of these is the loser's stock price. Which one of those two do you think is the winner of the bidding war? One, obviously, the stock price goes up after the event. One, the stock price goes down. Which do you think is the one that won the bidding war? The one that went down is the winner of the bidding war. Why is that? Why? I mean, losing a bidding war, the next day you get this headline, so-and-so company loses bidding war, right? Your ego is really damaged. But what did you say? So the bidding war is you bid 70, I bid 75, you bid 80, I bid, it's like eBay, right? 85, then you bid 90 and I drop out. You won. You know what? When you win an auction, you should always have mixed feelings. Part of you says, I won. You know what the other part of you say? Why did everybody else look at you and laugh? Because they said, he's paying too much, right? The definition of winning at an auction is everybody else thinks you're paying too much. The winner of the bidding war ends up winning, but then has to pay $90 per share for the remaining shares, including the loser shares. That's kind of a bonus you get, right? So the shares you accumulated during the bidding war, you sell to the winner saying, you know what, give me the $90. So if you ever have a shareholders in a company that's not in a bidding war, every night before you go to bed, pray. Please, God, let my side lose. Because if you look at the price change, it's much better. To be, but better still, if you're in a bidding war, you know what you should do, right? Just drop out. Let people fight against each other. Pay the high price. There's no winning a bidding war if you think from the perspective of your shareholders. This graph is kind of tough to read. So let me go through why you have these four different colors. So basically they're based on the size of the target firm. So the blue are smallest companies relative to less than 6% of your value. The purple are large, so small to large targets. And I look at cash, stock, combination of cash and stock. So let's start with the all. First, if you look at small versus large, you see where the winning is, right? You're far more likely to win with small targets than with much bigger, bigger targets. The bigger the target, the more likely you, you're going to lose. But look at cash and stock, you get this strange bifurcation. With, when you look at cash offers with large deals, cash is actually a much better way of paying for large deals. Stock turns out to be a much more attractive option with smaller deals. Why do you think that is? Remember the gaming problem, which you have a trillion dollar company. If you're a $10 million billion company and a trillion dollar, two trillion dollar company offers shares, you're not doing any gaming. You're, you're small, they're big, you just take the shares. But if I'm a hundred billion dollar company and I'm trying to buy you and you're a hundred billion dollar company, now you worry more about is the share correctly priced? So the way I read this graph is if you're doing big deals, you're better off doing cash deals. And if you're doing small deals, maybe you can get away with using shares, especially if they're overpriced. Finally, let's look at public versus private acquisitions. So the blue is public. And again, I'm looking at small to large deals across every size class. Public deals are by far the worst way, you know, the worst set of targets, right? You get, you know, even on really small deals where you have a chance of making money, they make less money than the other. So buying a private business generally tends to deliver higher returns than buying a public business. But there's a third way of growing, which actually is even better than buying private businesses. It's buying divisions of public companies. Why do you think that works so well? Remember the, the example I showed you at the start, four divisions? What are we all trained to do? Get rid of the worst business. At what price? It doesn't matter. Give it away for free. Ford in 2009 classified Jaguar Land Rover as their worst business. 
So when Tata Motors approached them, they essentially gave it away. Jaguar Land Rover has saved Tata Motors over the last decade and they effectively got it for free. You're in effect taking advantage of the fact that when new management comes into a company, the first thing they try to get rid of are the old person's mistakes. They want to make their own, right? Get it off. And they will give it away because they want to get rid of them. So if you're going to craft an acquisition strategy, you can already see targeting private businesses or divisions of public companies gives you better odds. Nothing is guaranteed better odds than going after public companies. Finally, this is from a McKinsey study that looks at how often companies deliver on promise synergies. So let's start with cost synergies, right? There were 92 companies in their sample and 61 of them delivered 100% or more of the cost synergies that were promised. So they promised 50 million, they delivered 50 million, often more than that. That's a pretty high percentage of companies that deliver most of it. If in contrast, when you look at growth synergies, out of the 77 companies, only 17 delivered growth synergies that were 100% or greater. So less than one, I mean, about one in five companies delivers 100% of growth synergies. Almost 60% of companies with cost synergies deliver on their promises. So if you are in charge of thinking about synergy, I mean, the rules are very simple. Go after cost synergies rather than growth synergies. If you're going after cost synergies, make sure there are plans in place before you do the acquisition because afterwards it's too late, right? You overpaid already, you can't get the money back. And most important, hold somebody accountable for delivering on those synergies. Otherwise, they will never be delivered. So is there a way to grow through acquisitions and add value? Yes, but it's a very narrow path, right? It's a narrow path where you've got to be disciplined, you got to focus on small companies, private businesses, make sure you pay a price that's less than the value. And perhaps you can succeed. And already you can see why it almost comes with a time stamp. You cannot keep doing this because as you get bigger, it's going to get more difficult to carry through. Why is that? When you're a really small company, one acquisition might be a 20% growth rate. When you become 10 times as large, you might have to do 10 acquisitions to get the same growth rate. You're going to run out of good targets. You're going to end up becoming undisciplined. I mean, I remember in, in 99, Harvard Business School wrote a case study about how a company can grow through acquisitions. They talked about an amazing company that over a decade had grown its market cap from 4 billion to 400 billion just by doing acquisitions. You know the company they picked? 90 through 99, grew 100 fold through acquisitions. We, we talked a little bit about it. Cisco, the company that grew with acquisitions. I mean, they did 15 acquisitions a year. And Harvard Business School wrote a case. This is how you can grow with acquisitions. And that's usually a death knell for a company when Harvard Business School writes a case about how well you're doing. Because it's almost like they got the timing exactly right. Between 2000 and 2010, Cisco did exactly what they did between 1990 and 99. You know what happened to the market cap? It went from 400 billion down to 100 billion. You think what happened? The company got too big. And almost by definition, you're too big and you continue to do acquisitions. Your acquisitions have to get bigger. They've got to become larger in number. And it caught up with them. I have never seen a company consistently be able to grow with acquisitions over long periods. I can point to lots of companies that have been able to consistently grow with organic investments. You talk about the Coca-Colas of the world, the IBMs of the world in the last century. You can talk about the technology, Apple and Microsoft for the most part have grown through internal investments. Once in a while, they might do an acquisition. Microsoft did by LinkedIn in what, 2013. But for the most part, great companies grow with organic growth, internal investments. Growth through acquisitions is an exception. So when a company says, we're growing with acquisitions, we can create value. My first reaction is, hey, given the history of acquisitions, tell me why you're special. Marcos has a company which grows only through acquisitions. Has a 1.5% return on capital on its acquisitions. And just says, just wait, good things are going to happen. Been waiting almost a decade. Nothing good is happening. At some point, you say, maybe nothing good will happen here because you've overpaid on those acquisitions. So any questions on acquisitions?
So I've talked to you out of working in m and hopefully, you know, but you know, that's your choice to make, map out your own path, right? Let's talk about changing value. We talked about value enhancement versus price enhancement. I'm going to show you two of my favorite studies of all time, kind of fun studies. First was done in the late 90s. And it looked, I think, at 64 companies that changed their name. And they changed the name in a very specific way. What, what was happening in the late 90s? The dot-com boom. You know how these companies changed their name? They added dot-com to their names. And there was another condition. And they changed nothing about their businesses. So things like steel, uh, a company that made steel, worked with steel scrap, called themselves steelscrap.com. Say, what? What's a dot com doing in there? There's a reason they did it, right? You know, the peak of the dot com boom. Look at what happens on average. These are many of them are small companies. On average, changing your name by adding dot com makes your stock price jump 150%. I think we've been wasting our time in this class talking about cash flows, growth, and risk. Maybe we should be talking, going through names. What's a good name for a company? I think AI slipped in is a good name, right? Olive Garden AI. What's that? Breadsticks come. Artificial intelligence. Nobody has any idea what it means, but the AI alone might add a 20% premium. It makes no sense from a fundamental perspective, but the pricing can reflect it. You think, why don't we play this game? The only problem is if you play this game, what the market gives, the market takes away. So here's a second study. So about three years later, dot-com boomers bust. These companies also changed their names. You know what they did? They removed dot com from their names. And when they did that, the stock price pops again. Thank God you're not a dot com company. You live by the market. You're going to die by the market. So you pick something. AI right now might be a good thing. No, 10 years from now, who knows what AI will do? I know very little about what pricing can do to your company. It's based on fads and moods and momentum. So let's talk about changing value. And by now we have all the mechanisms we need to think about that, right? To change the value of a company, you have to change something that matters. And there are only four things that drive value of a company. Cash flows from existing assets. So maybe you can find a way to get more cash flows from existing assets. We'll talk about some of the most common. You can try to increase the value from growth by doing what? What are the two ways you can increase value from growth? One is if you're a high growth company that's reinvesting too little, you can reinvest more, grow faster and increase value. What's the other? You're a mature company that's reinvesting too much. You can reinvest less and grow slow and become a more valuable company. We're going to leave both doors open. Maybe you can lengthen the growth period. That's so easy in a spreadsheet, right? How do you lengthen the growth period in a spreadsheet? You take the 10 and you make it 15. 15 and 20 spreadsheet, it's easy. But remember, to create value, you've got to earn more than your cost of capital. When we talk about lengthening the growth period, we're talking about how strong are your competitive advantages? What can you do to make them stronger? Because that lengthens your growth period. Everything you've done in business school is in one of those places, right? Your corporate strategy class is right there. Lengthen the growth. That's all I can think of, 10 to 15 years. That entire corporate strategy class, 10, 15, 12, plays out there. And finally, you can try to reduce your cost of capital. What's the first thing that comes to mind when I say reduce your cost of capital? Change the mix of debt and equity. But I'm going to give you three other ways in which you might be able to reduce your cost of capital that don't require you to change the mix of debt and equity. So let's start with the first. You walk into a company or a CEO, you say, I want to generate more cash flows from existing assets. How do you do this? Well, you've heard those two words in every restructuring, cost cutting and more efficient operations, assuming you mean what you say. You know why I say that? Because most of the time people can talk the talk, companies talk the talk, they don't want to walk the walk. What I hear is higher margins in your companies. If you have businesses that are losing money that you never expect to make money, shut them down. You think, why wouldn't somebody have done them already? Why does Aaron Hicks play for the Yankees? Still, if you know, don't follow baseball, you have no idea what I'm talking about. This guy hits like 100. And, I mean, I could probably go out and hit 120, I think. I just close my eyes and swing. Because the guy who signed him is still 
the Yankee manager because it's well established in psychology that taking an action and admitting to a mistake means you put off taking that action. You know, people wait too long to sell losers in their portfolio. You know why? Because the act of selling the loser is an admission of, hey, I screwed up. So what do you do? You cover your eyes. I don't see the loser. I don't, I don't, I don't remember buying that. 15 years later, it's still there. I don't see it. You, you develop this selective amnesia where one line just becomes invisible to you. So if you can divest businesses that are losing money or shut them down, do that. The next thing I'm going to so, say is going to sound mildly unpatriotic, but I'm going to say it anyway. I have never believed that it should be the objective of any business to maximize taxes paid to the government. I can see Bernie Sanders is already looking through the door saying, what is he saying again? No, right? But let me cover myself fully. Within the framework of the law, I want to minimize taxes paid, right? So what can I do to reduce my T in the EBIT times one minus T? Let's think of some of the ways you can do it. One is if you can move your income to lower tax locales. This sounds mildly legal already. So what does that mean? You know, that, Google, that YouTube is actually incorporated and registered in Ireland. Do you know that? Why? Because the ad money that comes into YouTube goes into cyberspace. It's not like it goes to a physical location. It's for tax purposes. The IRS has been fighting this, saying, no, is YouTube is part of Google. How come it's not? And Google has managed to successfully separate itself. But you don't even have to do something as decisive as taking a division and putting it elsewhere, right? If you're a, if you're a company in multiple geographies, you want to transfer pricing? You know what transfer pricing is? People who work in it claim all kinds of noble intentions. The objective of transfer pricing is move your income from higher tax locales to lower tax locales. So here's how it works. You're a company with German and Irish operations. Sometimes you do business between, within the company, like intra-company transactions. The German company buys something from, its, from the Irish subsidiary and you decide, transfer pricing, you decide the price. So when the, Ger the German subsidiary buys from the Irish subsidiary, do you want to set the price higher or lower? Because remember, this will become a cost to one, one geography and a revenue to the other. You're going to set the price as high as you can because then the Irish subsidiary claims it as revenue. It, the overall company level, it, it offsets, right? There's no effect, but you pay less in taxes. I know this, you know, you think this is so unethical. I don't want to listen to this. That's fine. I mean, but it happens all the time. There are thousands of people in transfer pricing trying to do that. So all you're trying to do is lower the T. By lowering the T, what do you do? You raise the after-tax operating income. You get a higher cash flow. Let's keep going. We know the math, right? I take EBIT times 1 minus T plus depreciation minus CapEx minus change in working capital. Is there something you can do with depreciation? Maybe you can get your assets written up and get a little more, more but that's tough to do. But it, when you look at CapEx, the CapEx we're talking about here is maintenance CapEx. Because we're talking about existing assets, maybe you can do it a little more efficiently. Or better still, if you have excess capacity, you can live off the fat for a while. What does that mean? When you're projecting out cash flows from existing assets, remember you add depreciation and subtract CapEx. But if you have excess capacity, you'll continue to add depreciation, it's there. But you don't need to do CapEx every year. You've got excess capacity. You're trying to pump up the cash flows from existing assets. And if you're a company heavily dependent on working capital, managing your working capital better means there's less of a drain in your cash flows. So this is your first stop as a CEO. Can I increase cash flows from existing assets? So think in terms of the life cycle. Where in the life cycle are your companies if your focus is on cash flows and existing assets? What kinds of companies will this be your central place to go to increase value? Young companies, mature companies, declining companies. It's going to be mature companies because this is the place you go to increase value. Mature companies, it's not growth that's creating the value. It's, it's, so you think, can I get more cash flows from existing assets? Let's do the second stop. Maybe I can get more value from growth. And here it cuts both ways. If you're a company which is in a good business and you're reinvesting too little, 
You're saying, why would we be doing that? Many companies have hurdle rates that are disconnected from their cost of capital. There are companies with 30% hurdle rates, 35% hurdle rates. Absurd, right? So how do they come up with these hurdle rates? They look at their history. We used to make 30% return on our projects. We're going to make that a hurdle rate. So you see what's going to happen, right? You're going to take projects until you get to 30%. Then you stop, even though your cost of capital is 12%. Those companies, you're going to encourage them to reinvest more. Even if they earn less than 30%, it's still higher than your cost of capital. So one way you can get more value from growth is to try to get companies that should be reinvesting more to reinvest more, either in projects or acquisition, depending on where they get that return on capital. If you have a company, though, that's earning less than its cost of capital and it reinvests huge amounts, they're actually to increase value. What are you going to do? Push them to reinvest less. You'll have a lower growth rate, but have a higher value because you will save more in terms of how much less you reinvest. Value of growth, you can see cuts across the life cycle. You can have young growth companies, we're trying to get them to reinvest more. And more mature companies, we're trying to get them to reinvest less. In fact, McKinsey, you know, McKinsey has published this journal called McKinsey Quarterly. I think I've talked about this. And one of the things they use is their own database. They have, a, they have a very rich database of clients and what they've done over time. So McKinsey actually went through different ways of growing and ranked them from best to worst in terms of value created. So over history and across all their clients, we're going to go from very best way to grow to very worst way to grow. Let's start at the top. Looking across all companies, New product development had the biggest positive payoff. A million dollars invest in new product development creates between 1.75 and $2 million in additional value. So you see, why doesn't every company come up with new products? It's also a very skewed distribution, a few big winners and lots of people who try and never make it. But if you're given just one way to grow, try to come up with a new product. It's going to give you the biggest payoff of all the growth strategies. Second best, expanding an existing market. By doing what? Finding a new use for a product. Have you heard of this drug called Ozempic? I think it's a drug for diabetes that now turns out to be very effective at weight reduction because it makes you so nauseous that you forget you want to eat for the rest of your life. Seems like an extreme way to lose weight. But think of how much bigger that market has now become, right? So expand the existing market. Maintaining a growing share in a growing market. Why is that easy? Because the market itself is growing. It's more forgiving of your mistakes, right? It's an advantage that Indian Chinese companies have over European companies. European companies have almost no room for error because the market is mature. It's growing at 2% a year. You make a mistake, you lose market share. If the market itself is growing 20, 25% a year, it becomes easier for you to grow simply because there's no bu more buffer built in the system. So the first three are all approaches which in general have created value. So you can see the, and then you get to the bottom of the barrel. And these are the two approaches historically that have had the least of a track record in terms of creating value. One is competing for share in a stable market. Why is it so difficult to create value by competing for share in a stable market? How do you get a higher market share in a stable market? You cut prices. You get the higher market share, but at what expense? Much lower margins. The net effect can be negative as much as positive. You get the higher market share, but you get lower profits, lower value as a consequence. And at the very bottom of the barrel, by now you should know what's coming, right? We spent an entire hour and a half on it, is acquisitions. Most difficult way to create value historically. We, there are these little pathways we talked about, but it is in general the most difficult way to create growth. So those of you valuing companies that grow through acquisitions, you're already climbing a mountain. It's a tough way to create value. And if they're not disciplined, it gets even, even more difficult to get them to have value. And just to kind of sober you up about growth and its potential for value, this is actually a table I update at the start of every year where I look at the percentage of companies that earn more than their cost of capital and the percent of companies that earn less than the cost of capital. So the sample size is 40. This is pretty much every publicly traded company in the world. Let's go down. Let's go to 69.4% of companies globally last year earned less than their cost of capital. 
31% earn more than their cost of capital. So it's more the rule than the exception that you have a tough time earning your cost of capital. You're saying that's because it was 2022. That number has never been lower than 60%, the percent of companies that earn le less than the cost of capital. So this is more the rule than the exception that companies have a tough time earning their cost of capital. So when you think about growth, remember that a lot of companies be better off growing slower rather than faster, growing less rather than more, because often they're pushing the limits of where they should be growing by taking investments that cannot generate the cost of capital. Let's talk about lengthening the growth period. I don't teach corporate strategy, and thank God for that. That class won't last very long. But corporate strategy is all about barriers to entry and competitive advantages, right? So as an outsider looking at potential competitive advantages, let's list some of those competitive advantages. First is brand name. As we talked about, brand name gives you the power to charge a higher price for the same product. If you're a company with a, with a brand name, nurture it, hold on to it because you don't want to let it go. If you're a company without a brand name, try to find a way to build a brand name. Works for about 20% of companies, 80% of companies. Brand name is not even a choice. It's not an option in terms of competitive advantages. So let's look at some of the others. If you can get legal protection against competition, would you take it if the government's did? Sounds like a great thing, right? The old phone companies got legal protection against competition. They were regulated monopolies. But why do you want to be a monopoly? Remind me again, what's the nice thing about being the owner of a monopoly? First, everybody hates you, right? You know how you get back at them? You charge 40% more. Makes you feel so much better about being hated. But if you're a regulated monopoly, here it is. Everybody hates, they hated the old phone companies. So you got ready to charge 40% more, but there was a little bit of a roadblock, right? What did you have to do? You had to go in front of a regulatory commission that said this year it's 3%. This is not a combination. Everybody hates you and you get a 3% price increase. I'd rather not be a regulated monopoly than give me competition every single day. So we're going to get legal protection against competition. Make sure in return, you're not giving up pricing power. You know what gives patents in the US and the pharmaceutical business so much value? It's not just that you get legal protection against competition, but historically, it's also come with almost complete pricing power. It pisses off us sometimes when you have to pay you know, what the Martin Trichelli $15,000 a dose. But if you remove that pricing power, the value patents would very quickly drop off. Third potential competitive advantage is switching cost. With switching cost, you want to make the cost of switching into your product as low as possible. But once people switch in, you want to make the cost of switching out as high as possible. Jake, what's your phone service? AT&T, Verizon. Okay, Verizon. I want you to stop by the AT&T store on 8th Street. Walk in and ask them, can I switch to AT&T? You'll have three salespeople surround you. 15 minutes later, you'll come out with an AT&T phone. But then check your contract, with all, especially the really tiny print. They've locked you in through the next three generations probably. And who can blame them, right? If you think about self-service, it is going to get commoditized. If you did not bind me in, I'd go Verizon, AT&T, AT&T Sprint. I mean, basically I'd be switching each month looking at the best deal. The only way you keep customers in this business is by creating switching costs. And the final potential advantage you might have as a company is a cost advantage. What does that mean? Your costs are lower than everybody else's. How do you end up with lower costs than everybody else? How does a Ramco end up with lower costs than everybody else? They got endowed 300 million barrels. It's not like the managers work really hard, right? They got endowed an advantage. So sometimes cost advantages come from being in the right place at the right time. Sometimes cost advantages are earned. How did Walmart get a cost advantage of its competition with economies of scale? And I really mean that not as a buzzword, but as real economies of scale. And if you have a cost advantage, there are one of two ways you can take advantage, right? One is to charge lower prices than everybody else because nobody else can compete with you and take a higher market share. The other is charge the same prices as everybody else and walk away with a much bigger profit margin. My, the, so when you think about competitive advantage, you say, how strong are those competitive, can I make them stronger? 
So if you're a CEO of a company, what kinds of companies is this going to be the focus? Companies that used to have a brand name where the brand name has started to fade, where you might be brought like, what can I do to give it fresh juice? Or a company that is historic or is in a business which has become commoditized, the semiconductor business, increasingly commoditized. How did NVIDIA stand out? They decided to go after a segment of the business where they said, we're going to make it about high-end chips. And they bet right because they caught the Bitcoin boom and now they're hoping to catch the AI boom. This is where value enhancement can help think about how does it change the value. And finally, let's talk about cost of capital. You think about lowering cost of capital, it says most people think about changing the mix of debt and equity. And that remains the option. There are three other ways though. You can lower the cost of capital. If you mismatched your debt to your assets, you're paying too high a cost of capital. You know what I mean by mismatch the debt to your assets? Using short-term debt to fund long-term assets. Euro debt to fund dollar assets. You're asking for trouble. You're increasing your default risk. Matching up debt to assets will make your debt less risky, less costly, lower your cost of capital. And there are two ancillary ways you can reduce your cost of capital. It goes back to a discussion of betas. Remember we said betas are higher if you have a product which is less discretionary, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is, so if you can make your product less discretionary, you're in effect lowering your beta and your cost of capital. How do you do that? Now, one way to think about advertising is what's the entire job of advertising? You cannot live, you're completely fine without it, but they want to convince you, you cannot live without, and if it works, maybe this is how we should judge advertising agencies, beta before, beta after. It didn't work. Beta is the same. You're fired, right? Because ultimately, that's that payoff is going to be a lower beta. And the other thing we said drives beta is how much fixed cost you have. If you can lower your fixed cost, make your cost structure more flexible, you lower your beta. So I'm going to show you two companies, and I'm going to let you play CEO of each of these companies. And I want to to tell me what you change the companies first is a German software company called SAP, competes with Oracle, global software company. I'm gonna describe the company in very generic terms. And I want you to come in as CEO and say, what would you change about the company? So this is a very well-run company. Already your task has become more difficult, right? It's more difficult if you have a badly run, it's easier if you have a badly run company. It's a well-run company, high margins. It's reinvesting about 57% of its after-tax operating income. So that's pretty active. And earning a great return on capital. 19.93%. So it's growing fast. It is a company, though, that is funded almost entirely with equity because the founding family and the managers tend to be very conservative. They've historically avoided debt. 99% equity, 1% debt. The value per share that I get is 106 euros. So you're CEO now. What's the first and easy fix to make here where you can change value? Add more debt, right? You don't need to be a genius. And you say, how much more? Well, in my corporate finance class, I actually compute optimal debt ratios by looking at what happens to the cost of capital as I change the mix of debt and equity. So I took my corporate finance spreadsheet for optimal capital, which you're welcome to use if you ever want to, and computed the cost of capital at every debt ratio. What's my objective? Lowest cost of capital. That's a 30% debt. They're at 1% debt. So the first thing I'm going to do is raise the debt ratio to 30%. It's a debt ratio they can live with. They have solid ratings. No, I'm not putting them at risk. The other thing, and this is a, a, the subtext to their reinvestment return on capital, is they've historically, at least in 2005, got almost all of their revenues from the US and Europe. Asia and Latin America were not even on their, on their radar. Maybe, maybe, and here, I know I don't know enough about the business to see if this is plausible. If I can get them to reinvest a little bit more in those markets, reinvestment. Remember, they're earning a 19.9% return on capital, well above the cost of capital. I'd even be willing to accept a lower return on capital with a higher reinvestment rate because it's still higher than the cost of capital. So different mix of debt and equity, higher, return, uh, higher reinvestment. The value per share I get is 126 euros. What was it before? 106 euros, right? What should I call that difference between the two? This is the value of control, right? You get to run the firm. You do things differently. That difference is the value of control. It was difficult here. Why? Because the company was well run. 
So I'll give you a contrast. This is 2003, a company called Blockbuster. Now it's easy to laugh about Blockbuster now. There's nothing left of it. I think there's one Blockbuster store, the original one that people go and take snap. You know, it's on Facebook all the time, I think, and Instagram. You can take pictures. Don't try to rent a tape. There's nothing actually inside the Blockbuster store. It's a store. It's, there's a company that actually did really well in the 1990s. So roll up. Basically, it went around the country acquiring small owner, privately owned video rental stores and created this giant video rental company. And then, I know at the peak of its success, it got disrupted by two forces. One was the original Netflix. Does anybody remember how the original Netflix worked? They mailed you tapes and you mailed it back. I mean, you think how primitive. We were all in a primitive time then. But essentially, it was the alternative blockbuster, much cheaper. You didn't have the, remember blockbuster, 30% of the revenues came from late fees, which is you just forgot the tape. And my kids used to do it all the time. The tape would be under the bed. Nine days later, you discover and say, it's not worth even returning it and just buy this damn tape. Netflix, you didn't have that. And the other was Walmart and the other companies. I think it was called Redbox, where you could, for a dollar, rent the, the 10 most rented movies. So disrupted, which meant that fewer and fewer people were coming into Blockbuster. But Blockbuster did not seem to notice. What does that mean? They kept opening 25 more stores every year. It's almost like autopilot. And the way they showed up is that reinvestment rate is 26%. The return they're making on those stores is 4%, well below the cost of capital. The definition of insanity is you keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. This company effectively is destroying value over time. The value per share that I got is $5.13. You're hired a CEO of Blockbuster. What's the first thing you're going to do the day you walk into your office? First edict. Stop opening stores, right? And in this case, reinvest. Get rid of that team that's in charge of finding the next store location. Just fire them right on the spot. There will be no more stores. In fact, if I drop the reinvestment rate to 0% here, all through time, my value per share jumps to 1247. This is, this is about as easy a restructuring as you can get. And in fact, if I can shrink the company even better, right? Because if I can get out some of the worst stores, I can end up with $14, $15, $16 per share. When you think about value enhancement, it's far easier to blockbuster than an SAP, simply because the worst manager firm is, the more you can fix and walk away with the proceeds. So when we start when you no, know, on, on Monday after I take your final projects, I'm going to bring this control question fully, a full circle, and talk about how it's useful in the context of hostile acquisitions, voting and non voting shares, even valuing publicly traded companies. So there's a chance of change. But make sure you get those numbers into the master list by Sunday, preferably by. 10 o'clock, give me a break. I need to pull those numbers, create the presentation. So give me at least a couple of hours to be able to do it. So if you keep putting it off, and I would rather have the numbers than not have them. So if you don't have them by Sunday night, get them Monday morning. I'll try to fix them in the presentation. But I would like the numbers in that Google. It's five, it's five points of your, of your 40 points goes into that, just entering the numbers. So that's Five gimme points, right? Make sure you get those numbers in, in time. I will see you on Monday. Yeah, I just wanted to talk to you about like integrating. So I didn't do as well as I'd like on the quarter. I have been actually studying for the final. So like if I ever do very well in the final, like, but I, okay. Okay, so I would still have a chance of like doing something. Like the final, you get up to sort of bother certain minds that you never can get in the game. So basically, there's like, there's a, you know, there's a, it's actually in that great team. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I have questions about the like, like, I have a quick question. Like, should you take your target firm out of like when you're running recessions? It's fine. It's a large market.
the seven children in the campus. Yeah. Okay, so you would need at least like 